We study billionaires, and this is episode 104 of The Investor's Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by RealVisionTV.com. Real Vision is the number one video on demand channel for finance where the world's greatest investors provide full length interviews and behind the scenes access. This is a service that Stig and I both use every single day because of the enormous value and insights we gain from listening to billion dollar portfolio managers. If you want to test out Real Vision TV for one week free or get a 10% discount on your subscription, Use our coupon code TIP, which stands for The Investor's Podcast, today. Broadcasting from Bel Air, Maryland, this is The Investor's Podcast. They'll read the books and summarize the lessons. They'll test the waters and tell you when it's cold. They'll give you actionable investing strategies. Your host, Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. Hey, how's everybody doing out there? This is Preston Pish, and I'm your host for The Investor's Podcast. And as usual, I'm accompanied by my co-host, Stig Broderson, out in Seoul, South Korea. Today, we have got a really, really fun guest for you because we got Mark Stevens with us. And Mark is the guy that wrote the book, literally wrote the book on Carl Icahn. His net worth is somewhere around $16, $17 billion here in 2016. And Mark wrote the book called King Icon, The Biography of a Renegade Capitalist. And Stig and I have both read this book. We were actually going to record a discussion about some of the stuff that we learned from this book. And luckily, we were able to actually land Mark on our show. And he is here today with us to talk about all of his adventures in writing this and studying and learning all about Carl Icon. So Mark, with that said... Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. You've been running your own business. I just want to throw this out there. He's the founder and CEO of MSCO. It's a marketing company. He's been running it for almost 21 years now. Mark, my initial question after reading this, and for anybody that hasn't had the opportunity to read your book, the amount of research that you had done to write at such a detailed level about all these different transactions, all these different deals that Carl did through the years. I mean, I can't even imagine the amount of research that you did to write this book. I was just, I'm reading some of the stuff and the detail that you put into it was just mind blowing. So my first question is this, why Carl Icahn? Why did you put all this time and effort into learning about Carl? What intrigued you to do this? It was mostly because we lived in the same town of Bedford, New York, which is a small town, an hour from 42nd Street in Manhattan. But a world apart. There's sort of more horses in town than there are people. A few stores. George Soros lived probably a half a mile away from Carl. And then there's a lot of movie stars. So anyway, I kind of knew about Carl through reading about him, but never paid much attention to it. And then I saw him in town one day. And given that the most of our in Bedford at any given time is 12 people, I went up to him and said, are you, are you Carl Icahn? And he said, yeah. We just started chit chatting. Turned out, make a long story short, we turned out we were both tennis players and we made a date to play tennis. No way. Yeah. So Carl had this beautiful, this is part of Carl's oddity. So he had this 220 acre property with a gorgeous English stone mansion, but he didn't live in it. He lived in a sort of a upper middle class house that he built on the 228 acres. And I'll tell you why in a moment. But he had a, Gorgeous tennis facility that he built for himself. Uh-huh. I mean, like a beautiful club, like any club that you would go to for membership, you would say, this is really a top rated club. And, you know, the English living rooms off the court. And we started playing twice a week. I meet him at midnight. We'd play till two and then we'd have dinner in his house. Now, a couple of things about Carl's personality, et cetera, which come across through this is that he bought the house from uh, movie star Jennifer. Jennifer O'Neill, who started in the summer of 42, but he didn't live in it. I said, Carl, why don't you live in this house? He says, oh, he was worth $1.2 billion at the time. Yeah. And it'll cost about five, six million million to figure. There's no way I'm spending that kind of money. So he lived in this nice house, upper middle class house. That's what he lived in. Never locked the doors, nothing. And, you know, that's the way Carl is. And at the tennis facility, which was beautiful, when you went in to take a shower after we played, the bars of soap were little TWA bars of soap because he owned Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he had these little free bars of soap. He wasn't letting that go to waste. 
So we met that way, and I got fascinated in him just by being his friend. Wow. So here's the thing that I'm so amazed with, Mark, is the fact that I didn't get that out of your book. Like you never let on that you had any type of like personal relationship with him. To be quite honest with you, the detail of the deals and the way that you had interviewed close friends, people who were nemesis to Carl, that's what you really portrayed in the book, which was really kind of fun to hear all those different perspectives, which I think the truth really kind of comes out when you hit all those different perspectives. So I didn't even know that. I said to Carl, you know, I'm writing, I'm going to write a book about you. And he said, well, you're just not going to do that, Mark. I'm going to sue your butt off. You won't have a house, you won't have a business. Your kids will be in the street. There'll be nothing to eat. I'm telling you, I'm going to put 50 lawyers against you. <laughs> you're not writing a book. And I said, Carl, you know, read my lips. I'm writing a book about you, right? <laughs> so he, Carl style is to call you at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And then again at three the next day. And all kinds of things. He, never, he basically never sleeps. He was always threatening me while we're playing tennis. You know, <laughs> simultaneously we're friends talking. We went on vacation to Palm Beach with our my wife and his girlfriend. Yeah. Who's his wife now. And just, he was bringing hell down on me. What he found out is I just went out and started talking to the M&A guys at the big M&A firms and the yeah. law firms, et cetera, yeah, yeah. Scott Narbs and those kind of guys. And he started getting word back. He's this guy Stevens is in my office and he wants to meet with you. And don't forget, Carl had plenty of enemies, so they will talk. The personality that I read about in the book, I could tell that he would just absolutely devour your personality, just like, well, then go ahead, man, because this is the way I'm going to do it. Like, right. I can tell he probably ate that up. Yeah, but he was really serious. He about, was really serious about, you know, really, this, he's going to stop this book. And he says, all of a sudden, this guy is just writing his book and I keep reminding him and Carl's the smartest person I ever met. Yeah. Uh, we can get to that later, but you know, I kept telling him there is a first amendment, you know, it, it actually applies to you too. And he dismissed that. So then he called me one night and he said, okay, look, I have an idea. We'll do it together. I'll tell you everything. Yeah. But we'll have a contract and we'll share the earnings. Now here's a guy, $1.2 billion. Yeah. Like this is, yeah. <laughs> and he wants to do a contract. <laughs> so I said, you know what? If you'll tell me everything and I can be flying a wall, then fine. So he had his lawyers draw up a literally like a 50 page legal oh agreement. Oh my God. I was going to do it. I went home, I read it, and I said, it's not because of the terms. I just know Carl. And I knew that once I went into a, gave him some control over me, yeah. the book would never come out. He's in a so I went wow. back to him and I said, Carl, I'm not signing that thing. And he went crazy. You know, it cost me $50,000 for this contract. And <laughs> he went crazy. But I said, look, Carl, I'm walking out of here. So either accept the fact that I'm doing a book without you. <laughs> and the interesting thing happened is that he accepted it. Yeah. And he, he opened up to everything. And he gave me his mother. He gave me his uncle, Elliot, who gave him the money to buy his first seat on the stock exchange. He opened up the doors to everybody and told me everything. That. And I also interviewed all those other people. And it was a hobby for me because I was running one of my businesses. So I've written a lot of books. This was a hobby to me, writing these books. That's how I learned. You learn. You learn fascinating stuff. So really, that's how it evolved. And this is the other thing, Mark, is I don't think that you necessarily portrayed him in a manner that was all that favorable. I, I don't. That's probably not the right word because... He comes across extremely intelligent, and I think most of that is just because of the detail of the deals that were constructed in the thought process. But the way that he went about working the deals and the way that you described it in the book, I thoroughly enjoyed it because I really appreciate a great negotiator. But for some people, they might take his personality in a very negative connotation. So I think that he, although he gave you keys to the castle, if you will, he also allowed you to really kind of write a very authentic biography that captures his personality so well. Oh yeah, Preston. And it's so much fun that you're saying that because we are big Warren Buffett fans and just knowing how he is going about his business and the way that he treats other people and how he negotiates is just very, very different from what Kyle Icahn is doing. 
Yeah, you might be saying that he's not even running his own business because there are no business. He has no company, really. I mean, so Bill Gates, who I spent a day with at Microsoft campus in 1990, he just crossed the billion dollar mark. And he asked me to come out there and I spent a day with him talking about various things with Microsoft at the time. So Bill created an oil well and a company like a lot of the billionaires. Warren has a bunch of oil wells. and They just pour out the money. Carl never had to really have a company. He jumps on the necks of CEOs and he bullies them to death. And it's, his, it's that way. It's that epiphanies that he has about who to go after and the fact that he can outsmart anybody. And in fact, you know, it's just interesting, but I did for Bloomberg TV, it's in the can now, I did it last summer, Carl Icahn's Obit, one-hour show, me talking about Carl. I had to talk about him in the past tense. And they asked me what his legacy is. I said he has no legacy. You think about it, Carl created nothing, he built nothing, he changed nothing. He just got really rich. Really unusual thing. is, You think about the other billionaires, they made, as Steve Jobs used to say, some kind of dent in the universe. Carl didn't do that. It really seems like his goal is always to outsmart other people. So could you comment on that, but also perhaps tell the audience why you mentioned before that he's probably the most intelligent person that you ever encountered? Well, last part first. Carl was a chess player at Princeton and a philosophy major. So he looks at the world through the eyes of a chess master. He wasn't a global chess master, but he looks at the eyes of a chess master, and he was a very good chess player, and as a philosopher. So when we'd be talking about any one of his deals, he and I talking, he'd talk about it in terms of, so what would Machiavelli do? Or what would a Aristotle do? What would Nietzsche do? You know, and he would quote them, and that's how he sees the world. And so I always say that the average CEO, these are the guys who Carl has gone after, Carl doesn't go after Warren Buffett. He's smart. So he goes after CEOs, who he always said, CEOs are all in their position through reverse Darwinism. The CEO's dumb, and he picks a person dumber than him and, until you have a moron at the top. And he felt all these guys were morons. They had 500 degrees. They had whatever. They were making $30 million a year and $100 million in stock options. But to Carl, they were idiots. And so if these CEOs thought three or four, most people think one move ahead. They're lucky. Most of these CEOs think three or four moves ahead. Carl thinks 11. That's why he beats them. But the interesting thing is, it isn't hard for him because it's not hard for Usain Bolt to win either. If you have the gift, Usain toys with people in a dash, in a sprint. He toy has time to toy with people. Carl does that. It's just, you can't really try to be as good as Carl. Wow. So I want to throw this out to the audience. There's a, a book called The Art of Learning. I don't know if you've ever seen this, Mark, but it's about a guy who he beat a grand chess master at like the age of 14. The movie uh, Chasing Bobby Fisher is after the gentleman who wrote this mm -hmm. book, The Art of Learning. And one of the things that he talks about in this book is how the guys that are really great at outthinking their opponent. They really capture that middle game. Like you got these guys that are really good at their opening move and maybe their closing move, but the guys who are brilliant, the ones who do the best are the ones who can handle the situations that have never been thrown at them before. And they can literally think through 11 or 15 steps in advance in the middle game of a chess match. And so what you were just describing there with Carl, I think that totally relates to the fact that A, he's a chess player and B, when you look at these deals and the way he was doing them, and we're going to get into that a little bit later, so if people are listening to that, we're going to get to that next. When he'd get into these deals, they were so complex, had so many variables, and I think for him, that is such an appetite for him to fulfill that desire of being in that complex environment and then outsmarting and beating the other person. And I can totally see how much of his life is oriented around this idea of chess and how all these acquisitions, these mergers and acquisitions and buyouts and all the other things that he was doing were motivated in a very similar context. And when I was reading your book, that theme really comes out that Carl, if he ever got in a position where it was an end game, where somebody basically, you had to put your cards up and see who won, Carl always had the winning hand because he had stacked that in advance and he knew that he wasn't going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody unless he had that final hand to win. Well, he wouldn't be there. You'd be his sucker. I would know that he stacked the deck. <laughs> he, he was able to, you know, he, he would never put himself. He'd have somebody you don't just realize it. You just position yourself as somebody that Carl 
would kill because you went in <laughs> with a sense of bravado yeah. and a little nugget of dime store wisdom. Yeah. But Carl's not going there because that's a gamble. So he's not doing that. He's he's not doing that. He had a guy standing behind me that told him the two cards I was holding. So, Mark, the next thing I would like to add to this interview is the whole discussion and the concept about activism. Because activism, that's really Carl Icahn's bread and butter. Could you explain in plain English what activism is and perhaps also come up with a story of how he's used this concept in a, a given business transaction? So, what an activist is, is somebody who, and all this sounds easier than it is, so you have to remember to go back to what I was talking about a moment ago. But an activist buys some shares of stock in a publicly held company and then, put simply, starts making demands on management of a publicly held company saying, I want you to take some of the money off the balance sheet and distribute it to the shareholders, which I am one of now. Management says, especially in the beginning of Carl's career, go straight to hell. Yep. So he says, okay, I have 4% of your stock. Tomorrow, I'm going to make it 11. And I'm going to ask you again. He gets 11%, still not playing small ball. They say, still, that path to hell is what you want to take. So then he buys more. So in other words, what happens is, now particularly, Carl goes in, you can go to any company he wants except an Apple or something. He has enough money, enough resources to buy enough stock, to buy enough of a position, and then influence other shareholders. That we want the money that's on the balance sheet to be distributed to the shareholders, using one example. An activist wants change. They want change... They always position one in change for the good of the shareholders, plural. Carl always wants change for the benefit of the shareholder being Carl. Some of the other shareholders benefit along the way when he does his thing successfully. Yeah, and one key element of activism, and especially activism that is used to, activism today, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's definitely harder in some ways compared to the 80s where Carl Icahn really hit his stride. And the reason why I think has changed is because activism became so popular that basically the government has to regulate it differently. But Mark, you tell this story at the very beginning of the book where he's actually using the concept of green mail the first time. So let's actually briefly talk about that because I think that's a super interesting concept. So green mail, that's basically money to go away. So let me give you an example. He was trying to take over a company and as you said, Mark, the... Um, Management really didn't want him to take over the company because, hey, they might lose their job or whatever could happen. So they were actually telling him that they would smear his name, that they were going to print out more stocks. Basically, I would say printing out stocks because they want to dilute his shares. But they also knew that he was a threat. So they actually told him that he could get $10 million just to go away. And they even gave him a list of 10 other companies that might be a good target for activism. And what actually happened at the end of the story was that Carl took that money and he actually used that to threaten another company. I just think that the whole entire concept of Greenmail, it might sound super counterintuitive because the management is basically using other shareholders' money to fight up another investor. And you might be thinking, why can that even be possible in the first place? Well, sometimes if the shareholder has bad intention, at least that's the intuition behind Greenmail, then it might be beneficial for other shareholders to to have their management actually pay that guy off so he would just go away. And this is not necessarily to say that activism is a good or a bad thing. It is done to unlock shareholder value, which is really the, the pure and the, the good intentions that are behind activism because it is the shareholders that owns the company. And I think a, a key point to this, Mark, is when he's looking for these companies that would be a hit, if you will, if, as he's looking across the array of different stocks that are out there that are publicly traded, he's really looking for something that the market is currently pricing at a at a parity or lower than the book value and has some type of something that he could quickly liquidate in the balance sheet or it's already liquid that he can then turn into a dividend payment or something that can be extracted out of that balance sheet. Is that a correct statement? The company can be trading at a premium, but if there's too much money on the balance sheet, for example, and it's not being distributed to shareholders. Management has no plan. It has no plan. Or they have dumb plans. And they start using the shareholders' money, which is what is on the balance sheet, making ridiculous acquisitions. Paul can then come in, take a big chunk of the company's equity, 
and then gather you and I, who are other shareholders and hundreds of others, and say, let's put pressure on them. And if they don't concede, we'll buy more stock and we'll replace the board and we'll take control. So the CEOs of these big companies, the thing they fear most is not failure of the company. It's like politicians. They fear most is losing their job. So, Mark, you mentioned the point where Carl was concerned about Carl, and then you have the shareholders, plural, and how sometimes they kind of benefit, but most of the time that's really not a consideration, even though he would use that, from reading your book, he would use that as a lot of leverage to get support from the other shareholders in order to help him force his position against the uh, management. Talk about that idea just a little bit more so our audience understands what you're referencing and how this is really kind of a short duration play for Carl to basically extract the money out and then leave the scene, you know, smoking (laughs) and no war chest left with the company. Carl is looking at other things, including why are they paying a dividend? Why is a dividend this low? And he suddenly starts making noise. And now when Carl speaks, everybody listens. So the other shareholders say, hey, what's Carl talking about? Oh, this company, ABC company, we know he's right. Why are they paying a dividend of 1.2% when they can clearly double or triple or quadruple that? So then you start to say, hey, yeah, like you're right. And then he'll gather the other shareholders around to join him with the weight of their holdings in the company to petition for a greater dividend. But at the same time, Carl is calling the CEO and saying, hey, buddy, I know you're a reverse Darwinian moron at the top. I'm going to take your goddamn job. So I'm making playing nice here, but I'm going to take your job. You're going to be without a job. You're not going to have a company. Yeah, and one of the concepts that I really like to throw out there is the concept of a proxy fight because, as you're saying, Mark, he's basically taking over the management of the company and how that works is through a proxy fight. So you will have the shareholders vote about the new board. And the way that he's doing that, and really to convince the other shareholders that you vote for him, was actually they were saying, I'm actually going to do this for free because like you, I'm a shareholder. I just want what's best for the shareholders. And if you compare that to management that are getting juicy bonuses and perhaps haven't performed that well in the past, and Icon has been successful with that approach, with the proxified approach several times in his career. It's totally amazing that you would think that management wants to basically dig in on their position so much so that they would go to a shareholder that owns 10% of the company and say, hey, we're going to take money out of our retained earnings sitting there in cash, and we're going to pay this to you to go away. That's totally nuts. Again, I disagree with you. Because if your view of the world is my power and role as CEO of this company is the thing I value most, Yeah, and I've got this bully who may... Uproot that? Yeah. Why wouldn't I pay? So actually their view of the world was, I want to keep my job as CEO. I want my suite. I want my jet. I want my money. I want everything. I want my power. And if I pay this guy with somebody else's money, which is shareholders' money, $50 million to go away, golden. Yep. Yeah. And Carl was perfectly fine with the fact that that was really the other, all the other shareholders. Let's say he has a 5% stake. The 95% of other people that own that company that have owned that company in past tense, and he comes in, takes a quick position, and you talk about this in the book, I mean, two months on some of these deals that he was an equity holder. Yeah. And he walks away with millions from the other shareholders, you know, the other part. It's funny, Preston, because as investors, clearly we know about Kyle Icahn, and we talked about him several times on the podcast, but this is just very different reading Mark's book and how detailed it is. And... I think I definitely think there are a lot of interesting takeaways in terms of investing lessons, but I think that the funny stories and the anecdotes about how Kyle Icahn's personality is, I think that's something that's really hilarious. So Mark, I got to ask you, could you tell a funny story, just something that you experienced in person or something you know about Kyle Icahn that you would like to share with the audience? There's so many, but I'll pick this one. He asked me to go with him one day to meet pilots at TWA. He wanted concessions from them. So these guys were in a hotel in Manhattan. I think it was a Waldorf, I forget. So it was 500 of these, however, World War II vets, right? Guys who flew the whole war, fighter pilots, and they're spending the latter part of their careers flying around TWA jets. But they still have the fighter pilot in them. 
and they hate this guy. And a lot of them had never met him. So Carl dressed, he always, he had a Columbo, the old detective series. He had that sort of bumbling persona he'd put on. He was never really dressed really nicely. It was like wrong tie, dollar shirt, a little disheveled. And he got up on the stage and they said, man, this is the guy that we're concerned about. We're going to win this one easily. And Carl doesn't say anything. He just stares at them for about 10 minutes. I mean, I'm literally talking 10 minutes. So this fighter pilots are there, pissed as hell about this guy who owns TWA, who wants to reduce their wages. They serve their country and they serve this TWA and he wants to cut their wages. And he doesn't say anything, which is silence can sometimes be a great weapon. I didn't know what he was going to do. He asked me to come with him. I didn't know he was going to do this act. He reaches into his suit pocket and he pulls out an egg. And he holds the egg in one hand, so if you can imagine an egg in a guy's palm. And he extends it out. And the first thing he says is, guys, he points to the egg. This egg is you. This is not a cooked egg. This is a raw egg I've been carrying around my pocket. So this egg is you. These five fingers is me. If you don't agree to the concessions, me squeezes you and breaks the egg. I don't mind ruining the soup. So as we start this negotiation, let me tell you where it's going to end. You agree or I squash the egg. And that was his opening scene. But that was his opening. But again, because he doesn't bluff. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he had told he me, I'm going to say something to the process that's going to really disturb them. But I'm going to go through with it. If I have to replace them, no matter what I have to do, this is not going to be a bluff. So here's an interesting thing that I'm thinking about, Mark. So he doesn't really care if the entire world hates him either. No. He doesn't care at all. There is no world. There's no world. You used to tell me, Mark, think of the word fair. There's no such thing as fair. Artificially manufactured word. He says, when two people sit down to a negotiate, this is a very instrumental part to his, to your listeners, his negotiating style and how you go into a negotiation. Two guys sit down in a business deal. There's $100 on the table. Everybody else who sits at the table says, we're going to find some way to divvy up this $100, right? I'm going to get some, and the other guy's going to get some. It doesn't matter what percentage one gets and the other gets. Paul always says to me, no, I want every one of those $100 bills. I don't want to be fair. I don't want you to get anything. There's no reason to be fair. There's no reward for fairness. You do fair with your kids. In business, in war, is that fair in war? No, there is really is no fair. People don't think I'm just some hard ass, but I'm not. I mean, I have kids that I adore. I've been married 41 years to a wonderful woman. I want to be very fair to my employees. I've always done that. But I understand what he's saying. But Mark, I look, at, I look at it this way. I look at the world as being very reciprocal. So if I have a deal with somebody that I'm never going to see again in my entire life, then I guess you could take that approach. But I guess I see the world through a completely different lens in that every single action that I put out into this universe is going to come back to me in some way, shape, or form. Maybe not the form that I expect. And so I look at a guy like Carl. Yeah, he has material wealth beyond anyone's comprehension. But at the end of the day, like it doesn't seem like he really has too many friends. And then the question is, is so... What's it all about? And I think that your quote that you were saying for the one hour documentary, was, you said it was with Bloomberg, that is like, what's his legacy? Well, he has no legacy. He hasn't really created anything here. And on the Friends thing, I saw all the time that when we, like, when we were in Palm Beach with our, his girlfriend, my wife, like, he was always counting, you know, who paid for breakfast, who paid for lunch. You know? <laughs> and he's a billionaire. He was fine. a billionaire. I, was fine with that. I didn't want anything from Carl. I didn't want anything from him at all except his company, which was uh, exhilarating. But he was a billionaire at this point. Yeah, he had $1.2 billion. He says, because my money is my army, and I need my army around me. That's one of the great quotes about how Carl views the world. Well, because without the money, you can be brash as you want, but you can't threaten CEOs if you can't go buy their stock. So this is a question I got to ask, because I know everyone in the audience is, is wondering this. Do you still talk to Carl? Do you still have a relationship with him after the book and everything else? We had a relationship after the book for quite a while. When he got divorced from Leba, who he was married to when I was most of the early part of my relationship with him, who was a beautiful Czechoslovakian ballerina, they didn't get along. After the divorce, 
he gave her the Bedford estate part of the settlement. Oh. Uh, he left Bedford, and he, we saw each other after he left Bedford, but then we never had an argument or anything like that. It just dissipated. He kind of moved to a different geographical location, and you're not really... Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And was he a good tennis player? So, he never won, <laughs> and he always wanted to play for money. And I knew that I, with anybody else, I'd be just walking home with an extra five thousand dollars. But I knew if Carl has money, and he's going to find some way to pull it off. Oh my gosh! All right, Mark. Well, <laughs> this interview was just so enlightening to capture really his personality and who he is. Because I mean, you see him on TV, you see him saying different things about the market now, which I know he's a enormous bear. He has these videos saying he's a bear on the market. When you pull into his publicly traded company, which is IEP, and you look at his positioning, he's short. He's over 100% short on the market. So for me, when I look at that and he's saying things vocally, I know the vocal part, which you hear him saying on the news, you really can't really trust or realize that that's legitimate. But I think when you look at his positions that he's filing on his 10 Qs and his 10 Ks, that's truly his position. So let me hear your take on that. He's not going to say to anybody, this is what I'm going to do until it benefits him for you to know and you act like a puppet and go in a direction. I wouldn't be surprised if he's a million long positions because I always find that what Carl says publicly is diametrically opposite to what he's doing. Wow. Really? Really? So don't, and it's not evil. It's just his MO. And he doesn't even almost realize it. It's just like it's so baked into him. It's so baked into him. You got trained as a pilot. You knew what to do when you saw lightning. Yeah. He was trained, right? He was trained by his DNA to act in a certain way, his DNA being primary. So he just instinctively, I'll end with this and say one more thing. He instinctively fools everybody most of the time. Wow, that's really interesting and something that we probably need to look out for in financial media and in general. Okay, let me just shift gears here before we uh, wrap up this episode. Mark, one of the questions that we always like to ask a guest is if they have a great book they recommend. And, you know, this might be a book about entrepreneurship because we know that you have your own business or it might be finance or investing in general, more activism kind of literature. Do you have anything that has really influenced your way of thinking? Actually, I'm reading a book right now that's the best book I ever read about how someone starts in an entrepreneurial way, a very, 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 very successful service business and becomes very wealthy doing it, which is called, I'm reading it now, Powerhouse. It's a story of CAA, Creative Artists Agency, and Michael Ovitz. Mm -hmm. It's just recently out. It's the best book I've ever read about how does somebody grow a service business and become, I don't know what Ovitz is worth, over 500 million, maybe a billion, and build a really amazing company. It's just fascinating. That sounds awesome. So, Mark, I want to give the opportunity to you now to give our audience a handoff to the books. I know you've written multiple books. Please name those books. We're going to then have a link to those in our show notes. So for anybody that's listening to this, if they want to go to any of these and they can't remember the titles or whatever, they can just click on those links that we're going to have in the show notes. But I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about some of the the products and things that you've put out there so that everyone knows how they can learn more about you. So I think the best thing to do is really to go to yourmarketingsucks.com and or go to Amazon and just log in books by Mark Stevens and you'll see all of my books. There's a number of Mark Stevens, but uh, I usually come up number one. You see the books there, but the books I'm proudest of is King Icon and Your Marketing Sucks. Awesome. Mark, thank you so much for your time. I know our audience is going to get a real kick out of some of this discussion. This was amazing, but we really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks so much. Enjoyed it a lot. Okay, guys, that was all we had for this week's episode. We'll see each other again next week. So one of the things that Stig and I are very strict about is not endorsing any kind of service or product that we don't personally use ourselves. So with that said, we give our full endorsement of our sponsor's content, realvisiontv.com. Real Vision is a site that Stig and I personally use ourselves, and it has had a profound impact on the way that we view the financial markets. One of the most important things a person can do is seek the knowledge of highly successful investors and business leaders, and more importantly, understand their thought process and how they make decisions. 
And with Real Vision, you get exclusive and in-depth interviews and presentations from the world's sharpest independent analysts, fund managers, geopolitical strategists, economists, and investors all in the same place. And right now, because you're listening to this show, we have a special offer for everyone in the TIP community. If you go to realvisiontv.com and put in our special offer code TIP, which stands for the Investor's Podcast, you get 10% off your subscription to Real Vision TV. And if you're not sure if you want to get a subscription to the site without seeing the videos and content first, we completely understand that. That's why Real Vision is offering the TIP community a free week trial to see if you like their service. So trust me. You cannot afford to ignore the value that Real Vision creates with these in-depth, full-length interviews from famous investors like Kyle Bass, Jim Rogers, Tim Ferriss, and many more. The people being interviewed often have a net worth far exceeding hundreds of millions of dollars. And watching Real Vision is like being able to sit in the corner of a room and listen to a conversation that you're not supposed to have access to. So don't pass up this amazing offer to tap into the world's smartest investors all in one place and go to realvisiontv.com. Don't forget, use the discount code TIP for your free week and 10% discount today. Thanks for listening to The Investor's Podcast. To listen to more shows or access to the tools discussed on the show, be sure to visit www.theinvestorspodcast.com. Submit your questions or request a guest appearance to The Investor's Podcast by going to www.asktheinvestors.com. If your question is answered during the show, you will receive a free autographed copy of the Warren Buffett Accounting Book. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. This material is copyrighted by the TIP Network and must have written approval before commercial application. Thank you.